So um, this morning we're going to do something a little bit different and just because um, Freedom Day, as it's dubbed, is coming up in, what is it, 11 days. Um, so uh, we thought we'd have a th think about this topic of, of freedom, which is really interesting, I think. Um, and I wanted to start with you guys by thinking, I mean, it's not too far from um, thinking about how will this be written up you know, COVID in the last 18 months, like how will that be written up in the history books? And I'm sure there's some probably medics amongst you that are into um, the the kind of virus itself and the, the vaccinations and all of that. I, th I think that could be interested, but I, I wouldn't really know. Um, then there's a kind of economics of it. And, you know, did we steer a good course for it? But I think the most interesting history books, I think anyway, will be the kind of human sciences, the sociology of um, this crazy... Um, I guess, world that we found ourselves in, um, like the Western world in lockdown. Um, I put a picture of the, f the first lockdown and seeing Piccadilly Circus just empty. Um, and, you know, fines for leaving our homes and mask wearing and social distancing and, and, and travel bans and all of this. It's been an extraordinary social experiment. Um, and it's, it's not quite over. You know, we've got 11 days. And... And then, you know, I'm, we're already seeing it, aren't we, the kind of release of that, but the thought of just hugging people in our homes and um, going to, the, you know, like a big sporting event. Uh, Wimble looks amazing. I don't know, at Wembley, I'm so jealous of the people at Wembley. Um, and I, I surely, you know, we'll all in some way appreciate our, our freedom with new perspective that we never would have had pre-pandemic. And uh, lots of people, anyway, at L'Oreal, lots of people are kind of predicting it to uh, the 2021 to be like the return to the roaring 20s, um, you know, when people returned from war and there was the Spanish flu. And um, and the, it, there's, I think there is, I can feel it anyway, there's a lot of like pent up desire to have fun. I feel like even this weekend, it's like someone kind of unscrewing the top of a champagne bottle and it's just going to erupt tonight, whatever happens. Um and, you know, I saw a picture of people on top of London buses and all of that on Wednesday night. So I think there is this mood in the country. I don't know if you guys uh, feel it. I, um, I did some kind of qualitative research uh, with my team at L'Oreal. I just said, you know, um, how are you feeling about <laughs> uh, the world out there and, and things relaxing? I thought I'd read you um, some, of, some of the quotes. So one girl said... Um, I wouldn't think twice now about going out for dinner on a Monday night. So that's quite crazy. Um, another one said, I'm spending loads of money and buying loads of stuff. I've got my lockdown cash to burn. Well, lucky her. Um, and then another one said, my friend never taken drugs before and has tried it three times in the last week. I was quite shocked by that. Um, and then another one, I don't even know what this means, but she said, it's definitely more wild out there. It's almost animalistic, she said. Um, and this is all pre-July um, the 19th, um, you know, so before COVID, the narrative has been for a long time, the less constraints on my freedom, the better. But post-COVID, I think the early indicators are that the mood, you know, it's only going to get stronger, that nothing is going to get in the way of people, you know, enjoying the roaring 2021s or whatever it is. So I think with that, in, in the background, it's quite an pertinent question this morning to say, why would anyone ri risk kind of religion getting in the way of that? Um, and I think for many people, um, this is a real and genuine fear that, that keeps them from even looking into Christianity um, or from like stepping into a church. And uh, I know, as I shared with George, that was kind of me for the first 20 years of my life. Just, I like gave Jesus and religion like a pretty wide berth. I just knew it was going to, you know, I don't know, but I knew it came with rules and stuff. So I, I wasn't interested. So anyway, that's the question. With the kind of background music of the roaring 2021s, uh, we're going to explore, does God want to uh, restrict uh, my freedom? And I'd like to come at this in two parts. And, and part A is um is this freedom without constraint is impossible freedom without constraint is impossible that's the that's what i'd like to persuade you of first um so suppose we take this kind of modern definition of of freedom to be something like uh, the absence of any 
um, constraints on us. That's the way I've been speaking about it. The absence of any constraints on us. I don't know if you can see the diagram behind me, but I tried to draw a diagram. Um, so yeah, there it is. Um, so you can see there, um, yeah, on the, on, on the left, not free, those lines are the constraints on, on our choices, and then we're the dot in the middle. And then um, on the right is, is us free. All the lines have gone. No constraints on my ch uh, choices, we're free. Um, so then in the last year, I thought I'd draw the diagram of the last year in lockdown, then what's happened is all those lines have come in a lot closer, those constraints, and there we are in our little houses and flats uh, with all the constraints on our choices. We can't go on holiday or do anything. And then Independence Day or Freedom Day on the 19th, bang, all the, all the lines disappear, no constraints on my choices. So that's, that's kind of, I think, the modern definition of freedom, I've got a few nodding heads, great. So, one experiment with that then is um, what happens, and we can look at it on the diagram, what happens if you've got wants that are in conflict with each other? So you've got two wants that are in conflict with uh, each other. So I'm doing an example. A young graduate, um, let's say in a city law firm, like a corporate, she wants to be a corporate lawyer, and she, she really wants to go far. She wants to be the top corporate lawyer. And she knows that's going to mean working late. But also, she's got loads of friends that she wants to hang out with and socialize with in the evening. Um, so do you see there, just in that one example, it's like it's impossible for her to have freedom in both those areas. Or well, suppose that same girl wants to have a, a family then she'd either have to sacrifice the freedom of spending her days with her children or the freedom of spending her days in the office working. She can't have both at exactly uh, the same time. Or, or suppose this girl wants to have the freedom to, actually she decides she wants to have the freedom to travel the world. But, but also um, she fell in love with an Irish horse trainer that lived in deep, like rural county Kerry in Ireland. And it's like, okay, you can't have the freedom um, to do both. And I think our culture likes to project this idea that there's just one thing called freedom and we can do anything and everything all at the same time. And, and that's what makes us happy. Um, but I think the reality is, and I think we all know this, it doesn't actually work like this. And we're constantly having to decide between uh, which freedom we sacrifice for the other. And, and so, actually, freedom is not the absence of constraints, like the diagram um, I showed. It's actually um, choosing the right constraints. And, and at that point, you might say, yeah, but Jack... Um, that it still is the definition of our culture if it's the constraints I'm choosing. So um, that still makes me free by today's definition. I'm free as long as I'm choosing my constraints. But then I push back on that saying, but we don't choose a lot of these constraints. Um, so a really a basic example, but um, you know, we get given a body. Um, so you know, I could say I'm free to go uh, and play in, uh, football for England. But my wife would say, Jack, you're not. <laughs> or she could say, I, you know, I've got freedom to go and be a uh, female vocal artist. And I'm like, no, you're not. Um, and, you know, there's so many hard realities about the way this world works. And we don't choose them. We're constantly submitting to them, whether it's the physical limitations of our bodies, like I just said, or, or, or sadly due to sickness or illness or injury or even social limitations like relationships or the law, as we've experienced the last um, 17 months. <laughs> so none of us are really free to do whatever we choose. It's, it's kind of like an impossible idea that's just put out there. Um, it's not actually the way that freedom works when you stop to think about it. Um, but I'd like to say, more than it just being an impossible idea, it's actually quite a, a, an unkind way to live. Um, you know, you often hear phrases... Uh, stated like they're just facts of the universe, like no one has the right to tell you how to live. No one has the right to tell you how to live. I mean, that's just like unspoken truth, of course. Um, and it sounds so good. But, but the reality is, when we stop and think, but no one's an island. No man's an island. Like, 
we're, we're all a product of a community of people who have invested in us and us in them. And so we're all, to one degree or another, um, we all kind of belong to each other. Um, they, and, and that community around us, they do have a right and opinion uh, and invested interest in, in the choices that we make. I, I wanted to give an example. Suppose um, you take just a romantic relationship um, and um, suppose in that romantic relationship, uh, one party always says, uh, you know, me first, uh, my needs before yours, my career, my time of the lads, or my shopping habits. Um, in that case, the relationship would obviously struggle and die, wouldn't it? Um, we know it takes both parties to habitually say, you know, I'll adjust for you. Um, I'll sacrifice some of my freedom, my needs, um, to meet yours. And, and we know that there's a wonderful freedom that comes in that. But to say no one has the right um, to at all impinge on my freedoms, well, if relationships like that, well, they could become actually quite abusive. And um, that's, that's really unkind, I think you'd agree. Um, so it's, it's, it's unfair. On, on friends, on any people who've invested in us, uh, children, husband, wives, parents, if we live as if they've got no right at all uh, to tell us how to live. So, th so that, that's kind of part A. In summary so far, um, freedom as defined by our culture, I'm free to do whatever I want, is is actually impossible because we're always constantly deciding between freedoms and there's some hard realities about how the world works that put constraint on these choices as well. Um, and then beyond that, as I said, freedom defined by our culture could be quite unkind because it is quite selfish to live entirely uh, independent of others um, who are invested in, in, you know, in our lives. So that's part A. Freedom without constraint is impossible and unkind. But part B um, is really interesting because that gets on to our kind of topic then this morning. God has sent his son to give us freedom. God has sent his son to give us freedom, not to restrict it. And I'm aware that's the exact opposite of what everyone, uh, or lots of people anyway, think. And, and when, um, when people think of Christianity, they often think of, of rules, Ten Commandments, or maybe... Um, it's from, like me, I guess, from growing up at young age, um, you know, there's a lot of formality and tradition. Um, and uh, or, or, or you see a lot of hypocrisy, don't you? Um, reading uh, on, on the Daily Mail, on the news, that leaders in the church are, are often not practicing what they came, uh, claim to follow. So it's so easy, and I really sympathize with people looking out um, uh, so fr from the outside, looking in, sorry, I wouldn't blame them to draw the conclusion of having the perception of Christianity being a, a bunch of rules, which is dressed in a kind of formal tradition and led by hypocrites. You know, it'd be quite easy, wouldn't it, to form that opinion. Uh, so, uh, in the next kind of eight minutes then, <laughs> I'd love the opportunity just to, to show you guys, and Kirsty, thanks again for reading that passage, what the Bible actually actually says on this topic and what Christianity is all about, straight from the horse's mouth, straight from Jesus. Um, and he's speaking in this passage to some religious leaders um, who um, were, were, were exactly that impression we have. They, they had the misimpression of thinking wrongly about God, that he was just impressed by rules and, and, and uh, strict rule keeping and that sort of religion. So this is what Jesus says to those sort of people. And you'll see straight away that this is an invitation. This is Jesus' invitation to the weary. And I thought that is so interesting from Jesus that his starting position is not that we're all living our best lives, you know, flying around the world drinking Aperol spritz, spritzes on beaches. You know, he's, his expectation is that he finds many of us weary. Um, he says that, doesn't he? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Um, and I just thought that really resonates with me. All you are weary of getting your cars stuck, 
you know, on yellow bo- boxes coming down Putney High Street, or weary of stepping in dog poo when you walk around on the streets, or weary of Heathrow waking you up at 6am. Or perhaps more seriously, you know, we're, we are just weary of, of lockdown and constant changing rules, and weary as parents looking after kids, or, or as children looking after our parents, weary from overwork, or weary from... Um, uh, uh, of not enough work and looking for jobs. Uh, many of us are weary of being anxious or being depressed, uh, weary of buying things we don't need or, or not having enough money to buy the things we really need, uh, weary of people uh, putting us down or, or politicians that um, let us down, weary of watching pornography when we really don't want to or drinking too much when we don't want to, or, or, or just weary of our bodies and their, their aches and pains or broken relationships or being lonely when we want co- company. Or maybe we're weary of trying to be good enough for God. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Now, um, if you're not feeling weary uh, this morning, then I'm, re- I'm really happy for you. And that's great. Um, but I, th- I think to anyone else and anyone who kind of anticipates they will feel this weariness and this burden, then that is a nice invitation to receive, isn't it? I mean, Jesus could have said, you know, you thought lockdown was bad. I'm going to tie you up in all my rules, you know. Um, but it's the opposite. Jesus isn't trying to force himself on anyone. Do you see? It's just an open invitation. He's very relaxed. He's a relaxed guy. We can come to him if we want to. We're adults. We can choose to. And and his expectation is that he's going to find us weary uh, and burdened by stuff. And he doesn't, he's not expecting that we come to him like on our best behavior, you know, looking really smart, all our lives in order, our kids really well behaved, or whatever it is, like we're about to meet the queen, you know, bow, curtsy. That is not what he's expecting. You know, he's expecting, for example, we'd arrive kind of with like dog poo on our shoe, arguing with our wives because we got another fine for driving in the yellow box on Partney High Street, you know, or whatever it is. He's kind of expecting that sort of weariness and messiness that's how he's expecting us to arrive at church and to people like that he offers a relationship with him not rules a relationship not rules um so it's not obvious from this that he's offering that so i'll explain it um if you just look at the little 29 he says um take my yoke uh, upon you and learn from me take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you don't see too many yokes around anymore, especially in Putney. But um, it's it. Uh, there we go. There we go. So the yoke is the wooden bit across the oxen's back, um, and that's what you use to kind of plow a field or whatever. I think I was thinking of the modern day equivalent of a yoke, and I think the easiest is just the kind of arm around the shoulder. And I couldn't think of a better example of this than the Brownlee brothers. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, it was they're triathletes. I think they're Yorkshire guys. Anyway, take a look. This is um, this is in Mexico uh, with two brothers. There we go. Great, great little clip that. I think we get the picture anyway. So um, what Jesus is offering, if we want him to, is that he would draw alongside us uh, a bit like, I get confused which way around they are. I think it was Alistair, the older one. Anyway, and he would, Jesus would take our existing yokes, whatever was making us weary or burden. He would take that off and he would basically put his arm round our shoulders and kind of replace that yoke. And that's another way of him just saying, I'm offering you a close relationship. Um, it, one in which he kind of binds us together. You know, it's a close relationship. It's a tight one. And it's one in which we can lean on him and kind of learn from him. That's the sort of relationship. Notice he is not offering rules. He doesn't say, you know, come to me and uh, uh, basically write down a list of Ten Commandments, 
go away for the rest of your life, keep them, and then I'll check in with you at the end and see how you've done. Okay? Off you go. He is not saying that. Um, he actually wants us to know him. He actually wants us to know him. Not just about him. Not just like, oh yeah, I remember um, I went to like a, you know, a carol service once or I was at school and I heard this thing about Jesus, the Christmas story, the Easter story, whatever. That's knowing about him. He actually wants us to know him. And uh, we know this because he says, he uh, says at the end of that sentence, um, I am gentle and humble in heart. That's what he says. Um, and that's what we're to learn about him. So we, that's the sort of thing you'd, you'd understand from a, a good friend, isn't it? That you know them personally and be able to say, oh, yeah, um, so-and-so, he, he's really gentle. Or, or you know, uh, when you get to know him, he's so humble. Isn't he a great guy? That's how Jesus is expecting people to kind of know and relate to him. If that sounds like a strange concept, knowing Jesus like that, how do you do that when he's not here? You know, he's not wandering around Putney. How do I know Jesus? Well, it's exactly like what we're doing this morning. You just kind of uh, read the Bible, look at him in the Bible, and it's amazing how um, he comes off the pages and you can really get to know him like we are this morning. So nothing, nothing weird about that, um, just like what we're doing now. So there we go. So Jesus is inviting anyone who's weary uh, to a relationship with him, not rules, and it's a relationship in which we should feel rest. Um, that's what he says. Um, uh, right at the end of that sentence, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So he says um, our experience of him le- you know, letting us put him, his arm around our shoulders should be one of uh, feeling rest and kind of unburdened. And, and if it, that's not the case, then something has gone wrong, right? So if you come to Jesus and you feel kind of more weighed down than you did before, he's saying, we don't know him. Somehow we've got a kind of incorrect version of him, like a skewed version of him. Because look what he says. He says, my yoke, his yoke, is easy and his burden is light. So his arm around the shoulder, should feel a lot easier and lighter than whatever was there before. Um, So whether it was like the burden of endlessly trying to impress a boss at work or the burden of just constantly trying to be a good friend or partner but never meeting their expectations or the burden of guilt um, from knowing we're we're trapped in negative behaviours like drinking too much or the burden of just running around, just wanting to please everyone all the time, or or the burden of having to keep our social feeds um, up to date, you know, with us living our best lives. Whatever it is, you know, or I think a lot of people feel the burden of just being on good form, of just like witty banter, and wanting to be that friend who's like always upbeat, but actually they struggle with their mental health. Um, or, yeah, whatever it is, the burden of anxiety at the moment, um, of kind of future uncertainty, jobs and homes and school and money and, and all of that. And, and Jesus says, in comparison to all of that, having his arm round our shoulders should just feel like a breeze. And we can bring to him our guilt, our anxieties, our fatigue, our disappointment, our hurts, our brokenness, whatever it is, and he gives us rest. Because he says he's gentle, he's kind. And, and ultimately, that's just what we're looking for, isn't it, in a friend? You're just like, oh, great. You're, you're just a kind friend. That's what I really need. Um, and, and amazingly, what people find when they experience that sort of kindness is that Jesus changes them. Not against their wills, because they feel like they have to. They just find that their desires change. And I was speaking um, to a close uh, friend um, last year, and he became a Christian in lockdown, actually. It was um, was really interesting. I can't go into the story. But one of the things he said to me is, Jack, I've just stopped watching pornography. He's like, I just don't want to anymore. And it wasn't like he, you know, oh, I've got to. He just didn't want to. Another person I know who became a Christian um, she just realised, she kind of looked back over the last five years, she just realised she had been overworking, like slogging her guts out. And she just was like, I'm going to change my job. 
Um, another Christian I spoke to, um, I uh, interviewed recently, actually, he was just a really angry guy. He was just an angry guy. <laughs> and um, um, he's just now kinder, <laughs> less angry. Um, you know, none of these people would describe uh, Jesus changing them as kind of restricting their freedom. You know, they genuinely want to go to church. They want to pray. They want to read their Bibles. And they genuinely don't want to uh, watch porn. They don't miss that. They don't miss overworking. They, d- they don't miss losing their temper. You know, are they in straight jackets? Um, has Jesus ruined their lives? No. Um, they just say, look, I've just understood and accepted this invitation that Jesus says, anyone who's weary... Um, They can come and have a relationship with me. It's not rules. And your experience of that relationship should be one of rest and feeling unburdened. Dare I say it, these people feel set free. And so in the final minute, um, I guess for those people who are still sceptical of this offer, um, perhaps if you still think, yeah, but I think knowing him will be a bit dull and restrictive then I I thought it might help just to flip it on its head and to say, well, what has he, what has Jesus done to make um, this offer um, possible? You saw in there, Alistair Brownlee, he gave up his chance to to win the World Triathlon Series in Mexico to help his uh, brother Johnny across the line. Um, But the the Bible describes um, that although we're totally uninterested uh, in God, He came in human form, in Jesus, and he was willing to give up his ultimate freedom of living in glory and comfort in heaven to be born as a man here amongst us. And he did that so that he might be able to sympathize with our weakness, so that he might actually be able to put his arm around our shoulder. And and more than that, he was willing to give up all the light and joy in his life to be to be mocked and spat on and and then nailed to a cross so he couldn't move how about that for giving up your freedom and he said jesus said he did that so that he could forgive us so that we could be forgiven jesus was willing to give up all of his independence so that we might have the opportunity to be yoked to him to have his arm around our shoulder and it would be weird, wouldn't it, <laughs> if he was willing to die for us, to be yoked to him, and then he'd use that just to make our lives really dull and unhappy. That would be really strange. I- I've said a lot there, but I thought I'd just try and summarise. So I-, I hope you were persuaded of this idea right at the beginning that um, being totally free to do whatever we want to all of the time is, is this a kind of impossible idea that's just put out there? And if we did live like that, anyway, it probably would end up being quite unkind to those around us. Um, so really, we have to constantly choose between freedoms. And the freedom that God offers us in Jesus is one of rest. And um, it cost him a lot to give us that rest. And I can imagine there's loads of questions about what that looks like and how that works, but... Um, my own experience, and I'm sure a lot of people here at the boathouse, and, and, and millions more besides, is experience, the experience of accepting Jesus' offer is actually that they feel freer. They feel, they feel freer with him than they did without him. And, and so the question to finish, I guess, to pe- people weighing this up is, of Christians that you know who, who actually follow Jesus, who've accepted this offer, do, do they look um, miserable and unhappy or, or, or free? Um, and so could it be, at, at great cost to himself, that, that God doesn't actually want to restrict our freedom, that he actually wants to set us free?